Hi, and welcome to our final discussion here in our periodic table and bonding unit. In our last discussion, we looked at ionic bonding. In this discussion, we're going to look at the other major type of bonding that we have to be familiar with, which is covalent bonding. I've put a molecule up here, which you probably recognize as water, and that's because water is a great example of a covalently bonded substance. Let's go in and take a look at covalent bonds and how they work. We started with this discussion in our last video as well, but remember that a chemical bond results from the exchange of valence electrons between two atoms. This is going to create the force that holds the atoms together, which is the chemical bond. Chemical bonds can be broken and reformed. And if you remember, breaking bonds absorbs energy and forming bonds releases energy. Barf! The two major kinds of bonds between atoms are ionic bonds and covalent bonds. And here we're going to talk about covalent bonds. So a covalent bond results from the sharing of valence electrons. This diagram shows you how a covalent bond can be formed. When you take two atoms and you bring them close enough together, their electron clouds are going to overlap. If those atoms are looking to complete their valence electron configurations, once their mutual electron clouds are close enough together, the electrons in each of the atom are going to join together and work to simultaneously fill the valence configurations of both atoms. You can see this on this diagram showing you the energy involved in bringing two atoms together. The best way to consider this diagram is to read it from the left to the right. Once we bring these two atoms close enough together, they will form a covalent bond and the amount of energy needed to hold them in that configuration drops off precipitously. If we got any closer, then we'd start to get repulsion from the nuclei. But there is a sweet spot where those two atoms are going to be most energetically stable, and that's the covalent bond. In other words, a covalent bond is a force of attraction between the atoms that are sharing the valence electron. That's where the term co, which is a prefix that means together, valent comes from. It's the sharing of valence electrons. A big difference between covalent bonds and ionic bonds is that the atoms in a covalent bond are not ions. Among other things, this means that all bonds between nonmetals are going to be covalent bonds. Another interesting thing about covalent bonds is that an atom can make more than one covalent bond to other atoms. Covalent bonds can also come in single, double, and triple varieties, where you can have one atom sharing one, two, or three electrons simultaneously with another atom. The number of unpaired electrons that an atom has is equal to the number of covalent bonds that it can make. You have this chart in your notes on page 11, but it shows you some of the more common nonmetals that form covalent bonds. You see the dot diagram for the element, you see the number of unpaired electrons it has, and you can see that in each case that equates to the number of covalent bonds that that atom can make with other atoms. The term molecule actually refers exclusively to covalently bonded substances. Nonmetal atoms that are bonded together can comprise molecules, and since they're nonmetals, they have to be covalent bonds that hold them together. Every molecule has a formula that tells you how many of each atom are in the compound. Here are three common examples, water, methane, and ammonia. Water has one oxygen and two hydrogens. Methane has one carbon and four hydrogens. And ammonia has one nitrogen and three hydrogens. Notice that in each case, we don't write the number one. This is common in chemistry. The number one is frequently omitted, with the notion being that if it's written down at all, there's at least one of them there. Interestingly, not all covalent bonds are created equal. Depending upon the difference in electronegativity and the atoms that comprise the covalent bond, the covalent bond can have a different amount of polarity. Let's start by looking at bonds that are not polar at all. So in a nonpolar covalent bond, the valence electrons are going to be shared equally among the bonded atoms. Generally speaking, atoms with an electronegativity difference of 0.4 or less are going to form nonpolar covalent bonds. A good example of this is chlorine. When chlorine bonds to itself, the electronegativity difference is actually going to be zero. And so as a result, the electrons are going to be shared equally among both atoms in the chlorine molecule. And so chlorine gas, Cl2, is a great example of a nonpolar compound. In a polar covalent bond, the electrons are not shared equally. This is due to a difference in electronegativity between the atoms and the bonds. Because the electrons are not shared equally, the atoms in the bond are going to have partial charges with the more electronegative atom having the partially negative charge and the less electronegative atom having the partially positive charge. This is generally found in atoms with an electronegativity difference of anywhere from 0.5 up to 1.8. A good example of this is hydrogen chloride, or HCl. If we look at the electronegativities of hydrogen and chlorine, we can see hydrogen is 2.2 and chlorine is 3.2. The difference here is 1.0, which puts us in that polar bond range. As a result, chlorine is going to be partially negative, 
which we symbolize with the lowercase delta negative sign. And the hydrogen is going to be partially positive, which is symbolized here with the lowercase delta positive sign. We use these lowercase deltas just to demonstrate that it's not a full positive or a full negative charge. It's a partial charge due to the polarity of the bond. Let's take a moment and try some examples of figuring out if a bond is polar or not. These are actually not in your packet. What I'd like you to do is determine if each of the following covalent bonds are polar or nonpolar. And if it is polar, identify the poles in the bond. Pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you're ready, let's go through it together. So let's do the nitrogen-oxygen bond first. Looking at reference table S, I can get the electronegativity values for these two atoms. The electronegativity of nitrogen is 3.0 and oxygen is 3.4. So the electronegativity difference between the atoms in this bond is 0.4, which makes this a nonpolar bond. Neither of these atoms will be partially positive or partially negative. They'll be electrically neutral. If we look at the nitrogen-hydrogen bond, the electronegativity of nitrogen is still 3.0, and the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.2. So the electronegativity difference here is 0.8. Since we're only interested in the difference, we just need the absolute value. 0.8 puts us in the polar region for this bond. As a result, we will have a partially positive and a partially negative pole. Remember that the more electronegative atom is the partially negative atom, so in this case that's nitrogen, and the less electronegative atom is partially positive, in this case it's hydrogen. Here at the end, let's take a moment and review bond type. It all depends upon the electronegativity difference between the atoms. If the electronegativity difference is greater than 1.8, that's generally going to be an ionic bond. Similarly, if it's less than 1.8, it's going to be covalent. The general cutoff for polar covalent bonds is anywhere between 0.4 and 1.8, with anything less than 0.4 being pure covalent or nonpolar. You have a chart that sums this up on page 15 of your unit 6 packet as well. But remember that it's all relative. And so polarity or nonpolarity is really only useful when comparing one bond to another bond. These rules are helpful as kind of back of the thumb approximations, but nature really doesn't care what we think. Is it possible to see a covalent bond with an electronegativity difference greater than 1.8? Sure, it absolutely is. But these things are the exceptions and not the rule. And so when we're learning these topics, it's not a bad idea to keep these rules in our mind to help make our life a little bit easier. As long as we remember that our human desire to categorize things really has no impact whatsoever on what nature wants to do. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of covalent bonds. Make sure that you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can explain how a covalent bond forms. Make sure if you can determine if a particular bond will be covalent based on the electronegativity difference between the atoms in the bond. Make sure that you can predict the number of covalent bonds that an atom can form based on its valence electron configuration. And finally, make sure if you can determine if a covalent bond will be polar or nonpolar and identify the partially negative and partially positive poles in a polar covalent bond. If you can do all of those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them in the comments below this video and you can always get in touch with me through the information in the info field. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.